everybody, it's Miss Audrey from the Fairfield County District Library at our downtown Lancaster location, and today we're talking about books! Yay! So, as you can see, I have a nice big pair of stacks here. I'm going to try to talk quickly again. Um, and they all feature authors um, who are African American or Afro Latinx because as we all know, February is Black History Month. Yay! But Miss Audrey, I hear some of you saying it's almost the end of February. Wouldn't this have been more useful at the beginning of February? Well, these books aren't really about Black history. These books, most of them are actually modern, realistic fiction that any kid of any background, any race, any gender is going to enjoy because diversity is a thing that we should be reading about all year round. For one thing, it's very validating for any human person to read a book or see a piece of media that portrays themselves in a really realistic way. And sometimes for people of color, that can be really hard to find. So our kids deserve to see themselves in books all year round. And um, studies also show that one of the best ways to build empathy and kindness and understanding and just a better way, uh, just a better world in general, is to read books that feature people from different backgrounds. So um, our children who are not African American or who are not um, Afro Latinx should also be reading books featuring background or featuring protagonists of those backgrounds to help build that empathy. So basically everybody benefits from diversity and these are all best-selling um, award-winning books from award-winning authors that basically every kid in the world is going to very much enjoy. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of books that are a little bit heavier in theme um, and then I'm going to get to the ones that are more just fun and more lighthearted and more um, like genre fic, like, you know, science fiction and fantasy and that sort of a thing. I'm gonna start with a couple heavy ones first and then uh, move on to the lighter ones. I'm going to start with the only nonfiction book on my stack. I've been, I've heard so many good things about this book. So when our copy finally came in this month, I had to read it immediately. It is called The Talk. Conversations about race, love, and truth. It's edited by Wade Hudson and Cheryl Willis Hudson. They're a married couple. And the book is exactly what the subtitle says it is. Um, it's uh, all of the entries are by authors of different races. They're also illustrated by artists of all different kinds of backgrounds as well. All of the entries are very brief, but they're incredibly well written and you get a lot of perspectives. And there are some uh, best-selling authors in here like Meg Medina, Christopher Myers, um, Renee Watson, who wrote one of the other books in my stack here, Grace Lynn, really just fabulous entries and there, all of the entries are in favor of more love and empathy and understanding and change to make the world better for everyone. It's a great book if you wanna just pick and choose a couple of things to read or if you wanna read it straight through. It's a great choice for starting conversations. Um, it's just a really good book for everyone of all ages, I'd say about ages nine or 10 up and up. So that is the talk. And it's the only nonfiction in my stack. The next book is probably the one that, like I said, is possibly the heaviest, and it's called Black Brother, Black Brother by Jewel Parker Rhodes, who is, a, like I said earlier, a best-selling author. She wrote Ghost Boys a couple of years ago, and she has a lot of other things on her resume as well. In this book, Dante, the main character and narrator, is 12, and he, as you can see, looks African-American, whereas his older brother, Trey, looks white. They are, in fact, both biracial. They have an African-American mother and a white dad. They have recently moved from New York City to Boston, where they are attending a prep school that is largely white. 
Dante is being very much so bullied by the king of the school, King Allen, and he keeps getting framed for things that he's not doing because people are making assumptions that he is a bad kid. And it culminates in the very first chapter with him um, getting framed for something he didn't do and he gets frustrated and he raises a, his voice a little bit in the principal's office and next thing he knows he's getting arrested. Um, while the legal stuff is getting sorted out, he gets arrested and suspended, and while the legal stuff is getting sorted out, uh, he decides to get back at the bully who started it all by learning how to fence because that's what King Allen loves best. He's a champion fencer. So Dante decides to learn how to fence to present a challenge to him um, and hit Dante or hit Allen really where it hurts. Along the way, Dante learns a lot about growing up, um, community, sportsmanship, and uh, fencing, obviously. It's a very readable book. The chapters are short. There's a lot of white space. It's not a very long book. It's got really cool sports content in it. I learned a lot about fencing, which I didn't know much about. Um, it's a really fast paced book. Um, and you really get inside Dante's head. Like you really see where he's coming from. This one was, it was a pretty emotional read. And it was, I think this would be a great choice for reluctant readers um, in a lot of different ways. So Black Brother, Black Brother. Our next choice, this is probably the one of the older books in the stack. It's but even so, it only just came out a couple of years ago. Um, I think in 2018, 2017, it's called The Parker Inheritance by Varian Johnson. If you remember the graphic novel Twins that I showed a couple months ago, um, it's by the same person who did that. In this book, um, Candace is, her parents have recently gone through a divorce. And so she and her mother have just moved into the house they inherited from Candace's grandmother. Uh, in Atlanta or near Atlanta it's in Georgia I think all right never mind I'm forgetting exactly where it is shame on me but no it's not even in Atlanta wrong state it's in South Carolina I'm completely wrong I think they used to live in Atlanta anyway ignore Atlanta they've just moved <laughs> to South Carolina and um, I read this book a while ago uh, and Candace's grandmother had worked for the local government and she lost her job because Candace's grandmother had thought that she had found um, a treasure map to finding this fortune um, that was tied to an old scandal. And she devoted a lot of time and a lot of energy to trying to find it and it didn't pan out. And so the mayor got very cranky with her and she lost her job kind of in disgrace. And so, but she leaves all of these clues for Candace to find, after, even though she's gone. Um, the grandmother is gone. So Candace finds these clues in her, her now deceased grandmother's house and she is determined to get to the root of the mystery that caused her grandmother's distress, disgrace. She, um, she enlists her new neighbor, Brandon's help. Brandon is a very quiet sort of boy. He's kind of being bullied by the more rambunctious boys in the neighborhood. And this is a really cool book because it's part mystery. If you've ever read The Westing Game or you've ever heard of The Westing Game, there's a lot of comparisons that have been made between that book and this one. So there's a lot of puzzles, there's a lot of mysteries, and there's also flashbacks to, um, 197, to the 19, 1950s. There we go, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, back to the past to the root of the um, the scandal that had happened um, that planted the roots of the fortune. And so it's, it's partly, there's a lot of historical mystery going on as Candace is trying to figure out the mystery in modern day. So it flashes back to the past as well as the future, or as well as the present. So. This is another really cool pick if you like mysteries, if you like modern day stories as well. So that's a good one. The Parker Inheritance by Varian Johnson. The next one is one I'm super excited to talk about. It's called New Kid by Jerry Craft. 
This book won the Newbery, Honor, or Newbery Award last year. It is the first graphic novel to ever win the Newbery Award for most distinguished children's literature contribution ever. We've had a couple of other graphic novels win honors. This is the first one that's ever won the award and won the gold. So um, Jordan, the main character, really wants to go to art school, but his parents send him to an academic preparatory school instead. He, they live in New York City, and um, he really wanted to go to art school. They send him to an academic school instead and he is one of the only African-American students at the school. Um, so as well as going, living in a very different community than most of his classmates, he also has a very different racial background and cultural background than a lot of the other students. Um, so there's a lot going on in this book. It's kind of a slice of life book. You follow Jordan as he's trying to learn about how to fit in at the new school. Some of the themes include code switching, like how does he keep fitting in in his old community and in his new school um, over the course of everyday life. Um, other themes are like what makes a good friend, trying to figure out who you want to be and how to be that person, um, different kinds of bullying, how um, just joking really isn't okay, um, but it's really funny. It's all told in a really funny way. Jordan's a very observant kid and he's got a really humorous way of explaining the stuff that he's talking about. And since he is an artist, um, he likes to draw out his thoughts. And so we see, we see his comics interspersed through the graphic novel. Um, and it's really great. And what's even better is there's a sequel class act. I haven't actually had a chance to read all of it yet. I has I flipped through. It follows Jordan's classmate Drew, who comes again from even another com different community than even Jordan does. And he lives with his grandmother um, in a, um, a rather impoverished area of New York City. So he has yet a, an even different set of experiences going to that school than Jordan does. So it sort of follows, it's similar. It, it's, it's talking about Drew's experience going to the school. And again, it's, it's very funny, it's very pithy, it's very observant, and it's, the kids are just, the kids are just great. They're very authentic, they're very real, and the kid readers are going to want to make friends with these characters because they're just so dang likable. They're really nice kids. So, Class Act and New Kid by Jerry Craft. The next book is also a graphic novel because it wouldn't be me with it without at least a couple, especially in a stack this size. This is The Crossover by Kwame Alexander, illustrated by Dawood Anyadabile. I really should have looked up how to pronounce that in advance. I apologize. Um, so this actually was also a Newbery Medal when it first came out as just a novel in verse and it won the Newbery Medal in 2015. This is an updated version and they just took the novel in verse and added graphic no novel style illustrations to it. It is the exact same book just now with 100% more pictures and more color. Um, and it's amazing. I know absolutely nothing about basketball, and I know even less about rap and hip hop music. I'm, I have nothing against it. It's just not my own personal thing. And yet, the minute I started reading the first iteration of this book, I could not put it down. It just sucked me in. The rhythm of the book, the way it's told, the way I immediately got into the head of the main character, Josh, or Filthy, depending on. Uh, what part of the book you're in. Um, it's just, it, it's so good. Um, it's a family and coming of age story as much of any, as anything, but Josh and his twin, JB, they are basketball players. Their father was a basketball player um, and he played professionally. So it's a family legacy kind of a thing. And through the course of the book, they talk about his father's heart health. They talk about 
their mother is the, I think, the assistant principal at their school, and she pushes for academic success. They're talking about, there's a lot of growing up in the book, they're in seventh grade, um, you know, trying to be your best self. Um, Josh and JB are starting to develop different interests, and how do you sort that out and stay close as twins and close as brothers? Um, again, it's a really emotionally stirring book. It's another really great option for reluctant readers, and the use of language is just mesmerizing. This is one of the most page-turning books I think I've ever read in my entire life. It's really phenomenal, and the illustrations are great. So, The Crossover by Kwame Alexander. In either version, they're great. Next one, ja um, Other Words for Home by Jasmine Warga. This is another Newbery Honor, and it's from 2020, uh, and it's also a novel in verse. So this is probably also a good pick if you've got a reluctant reader who, when they pick up a book, and the first thing they check to see is how thick it is. Novels in verse are great picks for them because there's so much white space. It's much less intimidating to hand a reluctant reader a book that looks like this on the inside than something that's solid words. Um, and it's beautifully well written. So Jude's family lives in Syria. She and her mom have to leave because violence has started to increase there. Her brother has joined a local resistance movement and her dad needs to stay behind to watch their family shop. Um, but she and her mom moved to Cincinnati, so there's a local con local ish connection. Um, and they moved to Cincinnati to live with her uncle, her and his wife, and their daughter. And adjusting is hard. She already knows some English, but she has to use English now all the time. Um, one of the things that's really cool in this is that for most of the book, it really sounds like Jude is still trying to learn English. Um, the way that she is very precisely choosing her words felt to me like a kid who is still trying to, like she has a limited use of English, so she's trying to like make the best use of wo the words that she knows. So I loved that. Um, and she also keeps thinking about Arabic proverbs and they're helping her sort of navigate her new life. Like one that pops up a lot is the phrase, um, that she cannot give what she does not have. Like that's a phrase that she thinks of a lot and her, her understanding of that phrase like changes as it goes while she's trying to figure out her new life. So it's another slice of life kind of novel while she's figuring out her new life and her new circumstances. And it's just beautifully written and there's a lot to, there's a lot to understand. So Jude's trying to figure out food, she's trying to figure out family, she's trying to figure out whether she wants to audition for the school play She's trying to figure out how to get along with her new, well, she's not a new cousin, but she didn't really know her much before. They lived in different countries. So it's, there's a, a lot of relatable stuff in there, even for American kids who have never left America. And it's just amazing. So next one is Ways to Make Sunshine by Renee Watson. And um, this is Pickerington's copy, but we do have one here at Fairfield as well. And I'd say this is the youngest book in the stack. Um, I'd say this one's great for third or fourth-ish grade. And a lot of people have been comparing this to Ramona Quimby, only modern. And obviously the main character is black. And she has an older brother instead of an older sister. And I would argue that Ryan, the main character, is maybe slightly more self-aware than Ramona, but she's still super endearing and super cute. And it's another sort of slice of life book that takes place in Portland, Oregon, just like Ramona's books did. So Ryan loves cooking, and um, she um, she and her family just moved into a new house, but it's actually an old house. They had to downsize. Her dad had worked at the post office, but he lost his job, and he got a new job, but it doesn't pay as much. So they're dealing with some money issues, which I think a lot of kids right now are going to very strongly relate to. So their family circumstances are sort of shifting and sort of changing, and so she's having to adjust to all of that. She's also having to figure out 
stage fright one of her other best friends moved to a, a new area and is making new friends she has to cope with that she's trying to learn how to live up to her own best self and there's just a lot of there's just a lot going on in this book without it being crowded and it's great and the the everyday details about cooking and going to church and going to school and figuring out how to live with an older brother is going to be super annoying. I think a lot of kids are really going to relate to this book. It's really, really good and it's funny. So that one's great. The next one, The Season of Sticks Malone by Kekla Magoon. The narrator, Caleb, is 10 years old and he wants nothing more than to be extraordinary or to be anything other than ordinary. He just doesn't want to be ordinary. But his dad never wants to leave home where it's safe. So he and his big brother, Bobby Jean, who's one year older than him, are stuck. But then they manage to find some fireworks. They actually trade their baby sister for fireworks. It's really funny. Um, don't worry, the baby sister's fine. They get her back. Um, but they have fireworks now. And then they meet this kid here. He is Styx Malone. He is 16 years old. And he suggests to them an escalator trade where you start with something small and then you trade up for something bigger and then trade that for something even bigger. And, um, and Caleb decides that this is the best plan ever to have the best summer ever and that Sticks Malone is everything he wants to be and that he has the answer to everything. But what exactly is Sticks, Mal Sticks Malone's own backstory. This is probably the funniest book in the stack. It is really, really funny. And there is a lot of heart in this book to, um, when you do learn Stick's backstory, it's, um, it's pretty heart pulling. They are, again, they're all really good kids and that you're going to want to be friends with. I love the family in this book. I love the family dynamic in this book. This is, um, this is wonderful. This would also be a really great class read aloud, I think. Um, and it's a great summer read or warm weather read leading into summer. So uh, The Season of Sticks Malone by Kekla Magoon. And now we are getting into our less realistic fiction and I'm going to jump straight on into that with Aliens. In The Owls Have Come to Take Us Away by Ronald L. Smith. He's done a couple of other really great horror books like Hoodoo, I loved Hoodoo. Um, but anyway, we're doing The Owls Have Come to Take Us Away. The main character here, Simon, is um, a biracial boy who loves Dungeons and Dragons type um, RPG video games. And um, he has asthma, he's not really much of an outdoors kid, and his Air Force dad is kind of a little, has opinions about that. But he is obsessed with aliens, or as he calls them, greys. He, they live kind of close to Area 51, and especially given his dad's career in the Air Force, he's especially a little leery of all of that. Um, Simon goes on a camping trip where something very strange and unexplicable happens, and after that he's even more convinced. His mom and dad don't really seem keen to listen to him though, and they make him go to um, a therapist and force him to go onto medications and I will say this is the one part of the book that I thought was a little iffy was the approach to mental health was not awesome but it worked with the plot of the book anyway um it is a psychological thriller though from start to finish you don't the reader is kept in the dark like you can tell that Simon is maybe not 100% a reliable narrator so the reader is kept unsure until the very end about what exactly is going on and obviously I'm not going to tell you that would completely ruin the whole thing it is a really good book especially if you're interested in aliens so the aliens have come to take us away there we go the next one is one that I've been waiting to read for almost a year and I finally got my hands on it it's called hide and seeker by Daka Herman and I mean just look at that cover isn't that amazing? So in this book, the narrator, Justin, his best friend, Z, went missing a year ago. Just poof, no trace. And then, poof, he reappeared after being gone for a year. And he seems completely unable to explain to anybody where he's been this whole time. In the, the first chapter, the, the opening scene is 
Justin and a couple, their other best friend, um, Lyric and Naya, going over to Z's house for his welcome home party and just the whole atmosphere of everything is just off. Things are not right. Um, Z's house is, is, is a wreck. Um, his mom is clearly trying to hold it together. She's thrilled he's back, but things are not quite right. And Z seems only capable of talking in these really creepy, really cryptic riddles. He can't just talk. And he seems like he's not actually completely present and he's not completely there. Uh, while they're waiting for Z to try to compose himself a little bit, uh, Justin and his friends and a couple other neighborhood kids start playing a game of hide and seek and it goes completely wrong and then after the party one by one all of those kids start going missing just like Z had done the year before um so that's the premise of the book um in the main cast of characters um until like a good way through the book only one of them is is white and that's lyric and he's also sort of the comic relief of the book he does it really well He's not a caricature, he's still a really strong character. Um, in this book, Justin is also dealing with his mother's death. She had died a year previous, and now he and his older sister, who's his guardian, are do going through some financial difficulties. And these, in addition to giving a really great emotional like underpinning to the story, it's really relevant to the plot. So it's all really woven in incredibly well. Justin's dealing with some anxiety issues and even some panic attacks. Um, and I think that that will resonate with a lot of kids, even if they don't have mental health issues, I think they'll really understand it. And it just adds a lot of, of depth to this book. If you're looking for a kid who's just looking for a scary book they can laugh at, maybe this might not be the best pick, but maybe you could trick them into reading something deeper by handing them this. I think they'd get sucked in and read it anyway and love it. Um, but for kids who just plain like scary books, this is a fabulous option. And the neighborhood feel is amazing. It's very atmospheric. And kids are never going to look at playing hide and seek again. That's really all I can say about this one. It was worth waiting a year for. The next one is the first book in a series. I think there's three books out so far. I don't know how many are going to be in it. Um, but it is called Dactyl Hill Squad, and it's by Danielle Jose Older. It's the only book in here that is historical fiction, but I had to include it because it's Civil War with Dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs, and I love history, and this is amazing. Um, and Older did so much research on this book. Like, in addition to looking up dinosaurs and other prehistoric reptiles that lived at the same time because pterodactyls are not actually dinosaurs. They were flying reptiles that lived at the same time as dinosaurs. I told you I love dinosaurs, I'm a nerd. Um, in addition to doing tons of research into that kind of thing, he also did tons of historical research um, to, to, to write this book. Anyway, on to the actual plot. Magdalus lives in the Colored Orphan Asylum in New York City um, when riots break out over the draft for the Civil War. And it, they were the, the draft riots. They were a real thing that happened like in real life. And in the riots, the orphanage burns. Uh, when the orphanage burns, an evil magistrate for New York City kidnaps a lot of the kids at the orphanage to sell them down south as slaves. So Magdalus and her friends have to team up with some local New Yorkers to save their friends. And it's it's great. It's a page turner. It's fabulous. The dinosaurs are great, of course, and the other, you know, the dactyls and everything. Um, pretty much every character in the book are, are, are BIPOC, so Black Indigenous People of Color. And it's, it's nail biting. It's so good. So, so good. I loved it. Um, and there's maps. There's maps. There's occasional spot art, especially at the beginning of the chapters. There's a mosasaur at one point. Wait, there's a dactyl. There's a mosasaur, which was an aquatic reptile. Like, they're so cool. And then there's back matter as well. 
So if you've got a kid who likes dinosaurs, this is gonna be like right up their alley. It, there's a glossary in the back of words the kids might not know. It talks about some of the real people, people it's based off of. The Colored Orphan Asylum's real. It really did burn down during the riots. The, the maps are accurate. It's, like I said, he did a huge amount of research and the story itself is great. The characters are wonderful and it's an ongoing series. Um, in later books, they go down south, they go out west. So pick that one up, it's great. Last but not least, I haven't even finished this one yet. See, that, there's my bookmark. I'm a little over halfway through. It's called Maya and the Rising Dark. It's by Rena Barron. And in this book, Maya and her friends um, really want to go to Comic-Con. Like, that's the kind of kids they are. They like things like Comic-Con. They like science. They like comics. They like magic. Her one best friend is super into the paranormal. Um, so Maya is at math tutoring one day when suddenly her teacher freezes like a popsicle and all of the color is starts draining out of the world and it's super weird. And other odd things start happening around her and she and her friends are trying to figure out what's happening. And um, since I'm not at the end of the book yet, it's hard for me to give a really great plot synopsis that doesn't give things away. Um, but I can tell you it's a page turner and it involves, they live in Chicago and there's parallel universes going on, fight between the forces of good, forces of evil, Orishas and saving the world type stuff, cosmic powers. It's great. I'm loving it. It's really good. So there you have it, a whole ton of books. I'm sure there's something in here that will appeal to the reader in your life. And of course, we've got loads more here at the library. Um, so before we go, we are still at the moment closed to the public, though we are fingers crossed, unless anything drastic happens, hoping to reopen in March. In the meantime, we are still doing curbside service and we will continue doing curbside service even when and if we do reopen. Um, we have also started doing subscription book bundles for kids, adults, and teens. The process is slightly different. The form you fill out for each of those age groups is slightly different, but the point is, is that you fill out a form and then every month you get a certain number of books or like for kids, it's between um, five to eight books and um, flyers about library programs and maybe a couple little goodies. Um, and then every month you get a new bundle and you can pick it up curbside. Um, we put them on hold for you and you pick them up curbside. Um, when and if we reopen, you'll be able to pick them up in person as well. And so please check out our website for more information and fingers crossed, we'll be able to see your beautiful faces soon. Thanks for tuning in everybody and I'll see you next time. Bye.